So we've all heard of the term glass jaw, referring to one's inability to take a punch without losing consciousness. But as it turns out, the force that's generated at the jaw isn't what seems to cause the knockout. In fact, the correct term should probably be glass neck. Since the inability of the neck muscles to stabilize the head during a period of blunt force is more likely to result in rapid and quick movement of the brain inside of the skull. But that seems pretty intuitive, right? Stronger neck equals less movement of the head equals less likely to be knocked out right? But what isn't intuitive is what actually happens at the level of the brain to cause the loss of consciousness. The mechanism behind being knocked out has been thought about for a long time, and there seem to be some decent hypotheses on what actually happens physiologically when we lose consciousness after taking a blow to the head. And the latest theory is a phenomenon called mechanoporation. But in order to understand mechanoporation, we have to first understand the anatomy and the physiology of the brain in order to understand how we got there. And here's what we need to know in order to follow how the science has developed. Along with the spinal cord, the brain is a part of the central nervous system. It is comprised of a series of nerve cells called neurons and glial cells. Neurons are responsible for sending and receiving signals, and glial cells are support cells providing structure to the brain. But for today, we'll mainly be talking about neurons. The neuron has three basic parts, the cell body, the axon, and the dendrite. The cell body controls the cell's activities and holds the genetic material. The second part, the axon, is the part I really want you to remember because it's super important when it comes to the understanding the mechanism of the physiology of a knockout. And the axon is responsible for sending messages from the cell. And the dendrite is responsible for receiving messages from other neurons. And all of the following mechanisms involve the neuron being compromised in some way. A very early theory developed in 1928 was that the blow to the head caused a depression in the skull that created a subsequent increase in hydrostatic static pressure pulse in the subarachnoid space, which is where the cerebrospinal fluid is housed and is intended to cushion the brain. But since we now know that knockouts are likely caused by the rapid movement of the brain, this is likely not the best explanation. The next hypothesis is called the convulsive hypothesis developed in 1944. This proposes that the mechanical force of the blow was actually enough to depolarize a group of cell membranes in the neurons, triggering an uncontrolled release of action potentials. Action potentials are just the signals that we talked about earlier. So basically, the blow to the head causes a quick seizure-like activity and triggers a loss of consciousness. So the problem here is that if this were the case, you would expect to see convulsive-like movements in fighters after they got knocked out. And since the question is, what causes the acute loss of consciousness, this probably isn't the case. Since convulsions after being knocked out in MMA or boxing are very rare. Another is called acute compressive anemia that was proposed in a speech given to the Medical Society of London in 1924. Like the first theory we talked about, this suggested that the compressive force depressed the cranium. However, instead of causing an acute hydrostatic pressure increase, in this theory it would cause a limitation of cerebral blood flow, ultimately resulting in the loss of consciousness. But this is widely considered not to be true given the fact that vascular incidents like these often take time to manifest. And again, since the type of knockout that we're talking about involves an acute acute loss of consciousness, this is unlikely to be true. Now the next is microtubule breakage. Microtubules provide structural support for the axons that we talked about earlier, which carry signals from the neuron. This proposes that rapid mechanical stretching or tensioning could lead to impaired axonal function due to the breakage of the microtubules. This could potentially explain some of the long-term side effects of brain injuries, but there's just one problem. Microtubules aren't exactly involved in the sending of the signal. They just provide the structural support for the axon. So this is less likely to explain the acute loss of consciousness. Okay, now here's where we get to the pretty good stuff. And if you're enjoying this video, please consider subscribing as it really helps the channel out. The second to last hypothesis we have is mechanosensitive ion channels. The term mechanosensitive simply means that instead of cells relying on ion channels to function, the classic example being a sodium potassium channel, that it's possible that neurons could be sensitive to extreme mechanical strain, very similar to whenever we receive a blow to the head. So we receive the blow to the head, these ion channels become hyperpolarized due to the mechanical tension, triggering essentially these uncontrolled firing of action potentials or signals leading to an acute loss of consciousness. But here's the issue with that theory. They don't exactly know how long it would take for these ion channels to normalize. So since the overwhelming majority of the time we see fighters regain consciousness in a matter of seconds, it's really hard to tell whether this could explain it. They claim that it would largely depend on the fraction of the brain's neurons that were affected as to how long it would take for those ion channels to normalize. So they still have to flesh this one out a little bit. And finally we have mechanoporation. Neurons are cells, they have a cell membrane. And as it turns out, if you induce a really hard mechanical stress to the cell membrane, like a blow to the head, it can cause a separation of the cell membrane that they call a pore. And Pettis et al. were able to discover these pores by inducing an experimental brain injury in rats and then flooding the cell membrane with different size markers. If the markers got through, it was determined that there was a disruption in the cell membrane. And these pore developments after a mechanical stress would obviously impede signal transmission, which would account for the acute loss of consciousness. It was also stated that based on what is known from some kinetic 
bank studies that these pores, depending on their type, could actually close anywhere from seconds to minutes, which would then account for what we usually see in fighters, the almost immediate return of consciousness. Now, obviously there are weaknesses and aspects to consider, such as that these were animal studies. Can you imagine recruiting people for this and it being ethical and asking, hey, we're gonna knock you out. <laughs> That would never happen. The second aspect to consider is that computer modeling was used to theorize a lot based off of previous data. And third was actually needing to visualize the pores in order to understand the shape and their function. So there you have it. As far as I can tell, mechanoporation was the most recently researched and talk about mechanism for the acute loss of consciousness, otherwise known as the knockout that we love to see in MMA. And regardless of what happens in the brain, it seems like strengthening your neck is the best thing that you could do as a combat athlete to try and minimize your risk for getting knocked out. Consequently, I have a video on how to strengthen your neck and it doesn't require any expensive equipment, so go check that out. Thank you guys for watching, I'll see you next time.